So this video is on the professional engineering ethics case uh, with City Core Tower. And this is what City Core Tower looks like presently. It hasn't really changed much. It's a, a very iconic building in Manhattan. It has that sloped roof. One of the interesting parts about that is that roof was actually designed for solar panels back in the 1970s, um, but they never installed it on there. So it was already they're already thinking about that way back then. So some of the details about this is the building was uh, con uh, completed construction in 1978 at cost of $175 million. It stands at 59 stories tall, 915 feet high. And what we're about to talk about is probably one of the most exciting stories about structural engineering and ethics. So a couple more uh, pictures of it uh, from different views. And really, you start to see why it's such an interesting looking building. Uh, the biggest part is that we have these columns in the middle of the walls. Now, any common sense person would say that we want to put columns in the corners of a building because that's where it does the most structural good. And you'd be correct in saying that. But if we put them in the corners, this building never would have gotten constructed. And the reason why is this small building right here. Back in the 1960s, City Corps organization, which now is Citibank, uh, they were looking to expand, and to do that, they needed to have a, a place where they could build a new headquarters. So they found a piece of property uh, that they liked. Uh, the only problem was on that was St. Peter's uh, Lutheran Church. It was built back in 1905. It was in really bad disrepair, and the church itself didn't have the money to fix itself up. But they knew that they had some value with the piece of property that they stood on. So the church entered into a deal where the City Corps organization would purchase the air rights over the building, they would reconstruct a new church in place of the old church, uh, and the church would now stay in existence, and City Corps would have a place to build their 59-story um, skyscraper. And this is located on the corner of uh, 54th Street and Lexington Avenue, if you ever happen to be there. So that's the, the new building that's been created. And there's a nice shot from the side, a nice aerial shot, seeing those, uh, those columns on it. Here's the hero of the story, or one of the heroes of the story. This is William Lemassore. He was a world-renowned structural engineer, passed away in 2005, and he was the engineer responsible for coming up with the idea of the design of the City Core Tower. And really, it started with some, some basic sketches. Um, he came up with this idea that if we take the columns out of the corner and put them towards the center, how do we get that load from the upper part of the building down into the center of the building and to the center of those walls? And to do so, he used a series of chevrons. And these chevrons are triangles. They span about eight stories each, and they transfer all the load from those upper floors down to the lower section. And you can see there's a central core of the building. It's a concrete core building with a steel frame on the outside. And these are some of the actual sketches that he created. Uh, we call them back of the uh, back of an envelope sketches, where you just kind of get some ideas on paper of how things are going to work. So his idea was that wind would be gathered up by the uh, the different floors, the eight floors that house these chevrons, and transferred into this trust frame, and that would be carried down throughout the structure. So it's amazing. Simple designs like this turn into entire engineering drawings. Uh, these are the uh, the eight-story tiers, uh, the chevrons with the columns running through them. They were going to span, like I said, eight stories each one. Uh, so they're large structural members. And those diagonals play a key part in what we're about to talk about. And some quick calculations, figuring out the loads going through. So now we're going to get into the incredible events of City Corps. So back in 1978, there was a Princeton student who only recently uh, became known was actually uh, writing their thesis on the City Court Tower. It was a relatively new building at the time, uh, and they wanted to uh, uh, do some more in, uh, investigation into it, some more uh, research. So the student requested from the structural engineer uh, copies of the plans and calculations, and you could not do that today. And Lamasaur's office was very good. 
Uh, they met with the student and provided them with all the information, the design calcs, and a full set of uh, structural drawings. Well, the engineer, uh, engineering student took those designs back, sat down, and started going through them. And this student figured out that based on quartering winds, and we'll explain what that is in a moment, they didn't think that tower was structurally strong enough. So the student went on to uh, contact the firm and express their concern. That student spoke with a junior engineer, and that junior engineer explained that the calculations that the person was doing didn't take into account all the efficiencies of the truss, and that structure was far more efficient than they thought it would be. So here's an explanation of quartering winds. On the left side, you see normal winds, or winds that hit per perpendicular to the face. On the right side, quartering winds come in at a 45 degree angle and they hit the corners of the building. Now what happens with that, with that is it splits the load in different directions. So the junior engineer went on to explain that it was a much more efficient system and there's nothing really to be concerned about. Uh, the student accepted the explanation from the engineer uh, and didn't give any additional thought to the adequacy. They were told that it was good and why would you not believe uh, a world famous engineer saying that it is um, and a, a proper design. Well, that junior engineer, after speaking with the student, went back to William Le Masseur and explained what was happening. And Le Masseur was was interested in that. It. It, it piqued his interest, and he went back and double checked his calculations. And when he did that, he he looked and found out that he designed for perpendicular winds, but never considered quartering winds like the student was talking about. When he redid the calculations, he determined that quartering winds produced what he called very peculiar behavior. What was happening was the diagonals on one side of the building went to having zero stress, and the opposing diagonals went on to have double the amount of stress than they should have. So that was, that was a little bit concerning. So what was happening at that point was when the winds came in at a 45 degree angle, you had some members that wind up having no stress whatsoever and others that wind up doubling their stress. And this is basically tension and compression members, uh, which you learn about in your statics class. So about a month before all this started, Lamasor was actually working on another proposal for two new skyscrapers in Pittsburgh. And he was planning on using a similar Chevron pattern that they did at the City Corps to deal with uh, wind bracing. One of the bidders that was looking at the job uh, was questioning the specifications on the project and wanted to use bolted connections instead of these expensive welded joints. Um, bolted is much less expensive to do. And that contractor said that if you're going to use welded connections, they didn't think they want to move forward with the project because it was just going to be way too costly to do so. Uh, we don't know if Lemasor remembered that at that time, remembered that City Corps had a similar question was asked, but it was handled very differently at the time. When Bethlehem Steel, which was the contractor on City Corps Tower, when they were doing the work, they put in a change order request to switch from a welded connection to a bolted connection based on some AISC specifications. And those were misinterpreted by the design team. And they were, they did in fact change from high strength weld to high strength bolted connections. Uh, no one saw that being a problem at the time. This did give the owner, uh, City Corps organization, a credit of a quarter million dollars, but it also made the structure a lot less strong. And again, no one knew that that was occurring, uh, that, that that design modification was going to have serious consequences. So when Lamasor started to review the calculation for City Corps, then he realized that they did switch to bolted connections uh, instead of the much stronger welded ones. So the design team improperly interpreted the code, and that created a severe design error. Since Le Masseur was the head of that team, it was his name on those drawings, he was the engineer of record, he was responsible for that. So at this point in time, Le Masseur was only one of three people in the world who knew that the tower was not structurally sound. It was him, the student, and the student's professor. No one else knew there was any problem with this, with this tower at all. The tower has been standing for three years at this point. It started construction in 1974. Uh, it was completed by 1978. <clears throat> so what would you do? 
Okay, right now you have a building that is standing there, nothing looks to be wrong with it, and you know there's a design error, and you and really no one else knows about it. So what would you do? Would you let anybody know that your design was faulty? Would you let anybody know that you made an error? Do you just shut your company and this way you're protected and you don't have any potential lawsuits? Close up the shop. Or do you go into hiding? Okay, just pretend it never happened and disappear. What Lamasor did was he hired a wind tunnel testing expert to verify that his design was actually incorrect. And once he got those results, he went up to his summer home uh, on Lake Sebago up in Maine, and he spent the weekend going through calculations and analyzing the results. And what he found was he was in fact wrong. He found that if you received a 70 mile an hour quartering wind, the building would actually fall over. And a 70 mile an hour wind is a 16 year storm event which is fairly common in New York City. But the building also had what was known as a tuned mass dampener, and that's new technology for, that, for the error. Basically, it's a large mass that is computer controlled. It sits on a bed of oil, and when the building shakes in one direction, this moves in the opposite direction, and that uh, countering oscillation removes the vibration in the building and helps stabilize it. So winds are not gonna get it, cause that building to uh, move. With that tuned mass dampener in place, the building could easily withstand uh, what we consider the 55 year storm, a storm that would only occur once every 55 years, as long as the power remained on, because the tuned mass dampener did require an electricity. Back in 1978, backup generators were not commonplace, so that was something of concern. So Lamasor had to evaluate the situation. And he would later recount that he figured he had three options. And his three options that he came up was stay silent, commit suicide, or tell others of the problem. And even though he's articulated these options to many people, he's always made it very clear that he really didn't consider those first two options and only considered the third option to tell other people of the, of the problem. He knew that disclosing this problem could lead to lawsuits, bankruptcy, and most likely end his career but Lamasor also believed that selfish worries were not enough to overcome his social obligation. Uh, in a videotape lecture given at MIT, he discussed the ethical dilemma, and I'll let him say it best. So Lamasor decided uh, that he had to go to City Corps, uh, but he decided when he did that, he wouldn't tell them that there was just a problem and leave it at that. He went there with a plan on how to retrofit the structure and strengthen the building. His plan was not only to present City Corps with the problem, but present City Corps with the solution. And he said, I had a scheme which I thought of before I opened my mouth. That's terribly important. You just don't cause havoc without having a solution. So once he verified that he had made a design error, he immediately went to City Corps and told them. And he met with City Corps' attorney, and that attorney immediately told Lamasor, before you go forward, you need to contact your insurance company and let them know what's happening. So on July 31st, 1978, Lamasor contacted the head of City Corps, but he was unable to do so. He contacted the attorney for City Corps, advised him to go uh, speak to his insurance carrier, and the insurance carrier appreciated the severity of the situation and immediately uh, got together a team of attorneys to strategize on how to handle the situation. The team of lawyers for uh, the insurance carrier and Le Masseur met with a structural engineer by the name of Leslie Robertson, and he was specialized in uh, high-rise design as well as disaster management. That same day, they also agreed, the attorneys as well as this new design team, to go contact City Corps' chairman, Walter Riston, and inform him of all the issues that were at hand. So things were moving very, very quickly. On August 2nd, uh, Lamasor and the team attempted to meet with the chairman of City Corps, but they couldn't arrange a meeting with them, 
and instead met with one of the vice presidents, a gentleman by the name of John Reed. Now, John Reed had an engineering background, and that helped him to understand just how severe this issue was. So they all sat down and discussed and estimated uh, what the repair costs would be, and then the Le Masseur team left the meeting. John Reed instructed them to return back to their office and wait until they hear further instructions from them. Two hours later, Reed and Riston, City Corps' chairman, showed up at Le Masseur's office to discuss a plan. And Le Masseur stated that Riston was fantastic and was not adversarial. You know, you just told this man that, hey, your building's about to fall down or could fall down. Uh, and he was looking for solutions and not looking to uh, point fingers and, and blame at this point. So as part of the first step, they arranged for emergency generators to be installed so that that tuned mass dampener would remain fully functional in case there was a power outage. They also uh, entered into a contract with the uh, designer and installer of the tuned mass dampener to have 24-hour service. So someone was there 24-7 in case that tuned mass dampener started to fail. On August 3rd, Lamasor met with Leslie Robertson, the structural engineer, to discuss how the work was going to be overseen. And the idea that they came up with was to put two inch thick, six feet long gusset plates with 200 bolted connections installed on each of the chevrons. And this was going to take place from inside the building. Now to do that, all the work had to be done at night without interrupting any of the people who were working inside the building. So the idea was at five o'clock when the office shut down, a crew would go in, carefully cut out the sheetrock. They would allow some of the connection to be made and then they would clean up the site re-sheet rocket and the office would go back in the next morning without having any uh, knowledge of what the structural repairs were. They see a little bit of sheetrock damage, uh, but that was it. So as the repairs started to get underway, the design team also hired weather experts and forecasters to provide weather data four times a day to make sure that winds wouldn't be a factor. Remember, in 1978, there was no internet to go to. and You didn't have the weather channel to, to have on 24-7 telling you what the uh, future weather patterns were going to be. On August 7th, Lamasor's office issued drawings for the repair work with the understanding that uh, this would open a lot of questions as the plans had to be submitted to the New York City Department of Buildings for review. The design team met with New York City and they explained to them the severity of the issue. And the city agreed that if they let this out, it would cause panic within the city. So they kept the reviewers to a small group of people so as not to raise and alarm the city. And the design team met with the Director of Disaster Services for New York and the American Red Cross to discuss evacu evacuation plans. The Red Cross actually mobilized 2,500 volunteers to go door to door in a 10 block radius, identifying uh, who was living there, when, uh, what time they would be working in certain locations to come up with an evacuation plan in case the building uh, was in danger of failing. And the reality of this is if you had a 59 story building and that were to fall over in a 10 block radius, they estimated that it could kill upwards of 200,000 people. On August 8th, City Corps issued a very plain corporate statement that said engineers recommended strengthening a couple connections and the work was being undertaken. And this way it wouldn't raise any suspicion or alarm people as to the severity of the structural uh, deficiency that was at hand. The city had agencies that, that really worked well. Their response was amazing. Um, the project manager for City Corps, Arthur Nussbaum, and hopefully you remember him as the chairman of HRH, he stated that it started with a guy who stood up and said, I got a problem, I made the problem, let's fix the problem. If you're going to kill a guy like Le Masseur, why should anybody ever talk? And that's a very uh, important thing to learn here, that here's a case where the engineer made a mistake and a big mistake, and he immediately stepped forward and uh, owned the situation. So Lamasor's actions have, been, have commanded respect from all those involved. The press did get wind of this, okay? They got wind that people were meeting with building officials and reporters started to ask questions. On the evening of August 8th, a reporter from the New York Times left a message for Lamasor asking him to, be, to contact him. The reporter had been calling him all afternoon. So Lamasor decided that he would reluctantly call the reporter back and answer questions. He was very above board and uh, was not about to start lying to anybody. 
when he called the New York Times office, he got a message on the answering machine that said that there was a newspaper strike and that all the newspapers in New York City were now closed. So he lucked out with that. Without newspapers, information would not spread throughout the city. Remember, we're back in 1978. There was no internet back then. Everything done, all the news was carried by the papers. So the work continued throughout August. And as welders raced to complete the, the welding operation, the structural design team received news that Hurricane Ella was approaching with speeds of 125 miles an hour, and that was on course to come up the east coast of the United States. If they were hit with 125 mile an hour wind, the structure would not have survived. Uh, we, the, the winds far exceeded capacity of the building. And this was actually predicted to hit over Labor Day weekend as well. But fortunately, just as quickly as that hurricane started to strengthen, it made a sharp turn and went out to sea and caused no damage. So Lamasaur once again lucked out quite a bit. Once the repairs were completed, the building was certified as being capable of withstanding the 700 year storm. And that's without having that tuned mass dampener working. So very, very good structural repairs. Now, all of this story was largely unknown to all but a few people until an article in the New Yorker magazine was published in May of 1995. So from 1978 to 1995, no one ever spoke of this. Few people knew about it, but it was not ever spoken about. Since that time, since 1995, this event has been the premier example of engineering ethics where someone who made a huge error stood up and faced it head on. So what happened to Le Masseur? Well, the initial estimate for, estimate for repair work was at a million dollars. That was his initial thought of what the cost would be. As they got further into it, he revised that estimate up to $4.3 million. The contractor later reported that the construction work alone ran $8 million. So the final cost was north of $8 million. City Corps negotiated with Le Masseur's liability carrier, and they accepted the full $2 million value of his, his liability policy, and City Corps decided not to sue Le Masseur for any additional money. So they took the value of the policy, and they let the issue go. So what did the insurance carrier do with Le Masseur? Do you think it was hard for him to get insurance after making such a severe error that cost that carrier a huge sum of money? Well, the insurance carrier actually lowered his rates. What they realized is that they had a true professional who acted in the best interest of everybody, except for himself, to ensure that no loss of life occurred and he averted a major disaster, which would have been even more expensive. He basically threw himself out there, exposing all of his errors, and ran the risk of ruining his reputation. All right, but he that didn't happen. The carrier realized what he did, and they were appreciative of it. Appreciative of it, and they actually lowered the rates. If they had made an example out of Lamasor, no other engineer would ever have come forward if faced with a similar predicament. If you saw someone getting hung out to dry for coming forward and, and saying that they did something wrong, no one would ever want to take responsibility like that. Now, the reason that Le Masseur came forward was he believes in the NSPE's Code of Ethics for Engineers. And there's six canons that engineers who are part members of the NSPE are supposed to obey and, and live by. It states that engineers, one, must hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Two, perform services only in the areas of their competence. Three, issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. Four, Act for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. Five, avoid deceptive acts. And lastly, conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. And I think you, looking at these six canons of engineering, um, uh, of, of enge that engineers have to engineering ethics, um, I, we can easily say that William Lamasor uh, did meet this, these standards. So my favorite part of the story was that the graduate student who questioned Lame Masseur didn't even know that the chain of events that she that occurred until she watched this on a BBC documentary in the late 1990s. So she had no idea that any of this had occurred until she was watching a movie one day. Diane Hartley is her name. She was a Princeton graduate and she unknowingly set off a chain of events that prevented the collapse of a skyscraper. 
So would you have the courage to question someone who's considered to be a world-renowned expert if you were thought you were wrong? Think about that. You're a college student and you come across a design calculation that you think you think might be wrong. Would you go to that person and question them? Would you have the courage to admit that you made a mistake knowing it could ruin your reputation and cause you to never work again in your field? So if you were Lane Massore, would you have opened up your mouth? Would you have blown the whistle on yourself? What if it wasn't a skyscraper falling, but it was maybe just something a little bit smaller? How, how small of a mistake are you willing to just overlook and not tell the client that you made a mistake? Or could you live with the fact that you did nothing and knew that there was this horrible secret about your work hanging out there waiting to be exposed? That's something that will be on you for a long time. So these are those questions you have to think about when, you're, uh, when you run into these design considerations, these design errors, which we all will make. Okay, you, you will make mistakes in your careers. How you handle it will set you apart from others. So if you want to know more about Diane Hartley, um, there's a 35-minute interview at this website. Uh, not, you don't have to watch. It is kind of interesting. Uh, it's an amazing story of how she, she uh, came up through Princeton. Um, honestly, I don't think I'd have the guts to question an industry leader. If I came across calculations that I thought were wrong, the first thing that I would, would think is that my numbers are wrong. I would never think that the other engineer made a mistake. I would think it was mine. But thankfully, she did. If she didn't question that, uh, that, that engineer, uh, we would have a disaster. Okay, so she saved thousands of lives. So I'm hoping that this might get some of you to change your mind and come over to engineering. Okay, you see how exciting it can be? Um, think about it. 